Amen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for everyone that's led us already in our time of worship together. I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is what we're going to be studying this morning. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, we have some on our resource table straight in the back there, so feel free to go grab one. My family and I uh, moved with a small group of people to College Park in 2013 to plant this church. Uh, But before we got here, Denise and I went through uh, a series of assessments with two different church planting networks to see whether we had the wiring and the gifting to do this kind of work. And uh, while we were doing all that, I, I find myself going to different fellowship events and training events with different, both of these networks, and sometimes they sort of overlapped, and it's like, which one am I going to today? But, but I found it quite humorous that I could identify which network meeting I was at based upon how people in the room were dressed. Uh, It's true, right? I I could go into one room, and if I saw guys with beards and hipster glasses and plaid and skinny jeans, I knew exactly what network I was at. And if I walked in another one, this is the Baptist one, just to give it away, I saw people with polos on and and, and, uh, khakis, I was like, okay, I know where I'm at, right? Now, it's kind of humorous, right? Uh, Before a word was said, I could tell who they were based upon the way they were dressed, Now, ultimately, of course, that didn't matter, guys. It just didn't matter, right? Both of these networks loved Jesus and wanted to plant churches both here and abroad. But you have to admit that their attire communicated something, at least to me. Now, whether that was significant, it's another matter, but but it did say something about who they were. I remember a pastor friend of mine years ago said, Rob, everything that we do communicates something. That's That's a really powerful statement, actually. And today, we come to a text in Scripture that is unusual to say the least, all right? Uh, It's a text that literally is going to talk about the attire that should be worn or not worn in the church. And what I think, and we're going to see, I hope anyway, in this text, is that it's less about the attire and more about what that attire communicated, okay? So let's go ahead and read it, and as we read it, you'll know what I mean about a strange text, all right? (laughs) 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 2, and we'll go all the way down to verse 16. Paul writes, Now, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it's disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or to shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man." For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. This is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman gets hair, uh, has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practices, nor do the churches of God. Just to clarify, I think it's important to pray every Sunday before we open God's Word, but I feel especially the need to pray this morning. Lord, thank you for your Word. It is good. Uh, Lord, it is, I believe, as the Word proclaims, sweeter, sweet as honey on our lips. I pray that that would be the case this morning, Lord. Love you, Jesus. Help us to come with open hands and submissive hearts to you. Pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I sat down at my kitchen table on Monday morning, eager to get started on sermon prep, 
And I opened up 1 Corinthians 11 and I jumped in and began to read this passage and study it. And about three hours later, Denise walked into the kitchen and asked me how it was going. And this is what I look like. All right. <laughs> yeah. Stressed out, man. Like this is a tough passage. There's just no way to get around it, right? I was telling several of my brothers this week that there are some passages in the scripture that are really, really hard to understand, but once you get them, it's easy to receive the truth therein. And then there are other passages that are easy to understand, but hard to receive the truth. Well, this big boy here has got both of them. It is extremely hard to understand, and I believe it to be very hard to receive in the culture that we currently live in. And these are the weeks where our commitment to expository preaching is put to the test. Are we really going to go verse by verse? Yes, we are. So let's get at it here. I do want to say on the beginning here that this is one of those uh, texts of scriptures that we can get lost in in a hurry. We could proverbially miss the forest for the trees because there are so many questions in this text, aren't they? So many questions here. Um, and I say that to just let you know that there's a lot of rabbit holes that we can go down, and I'm not probably going to get to every question you have about this text. In fact, I decided to take two weeks to try to cover this because it's hard to understand and complicated. So we'll get two weeks at it, but I'm still probably not going to get to every question. Some I'll answer with more conviction than others. And what I miss, I, I, I promise you, your community group leaders can handle. So <laughs> ask them this week. They, <laughs> so have fun with that, CG leaders, all right? So, let's get at the main idea. Here's what I think is the main idea of 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. That the church of God should seek to communicate clearly, and I would add here joyfully, in our worship gatherings, the beauty of God's design for manhood and womanhood. All right? So, let's make a note of where we are in the book. Right? It's always good to remind ourselves of context. This is a letter that Paul had written to a church that he planted in the city of Corinth. At the first part of this letter, he addressed quest, uh, some things he had heard about the church, some things that were going on. But, but now he's in what I call the now concerning part of the letter. He's answering questions that they had written a letter to him about now concerning these matters. It starts in verse 7. And so it is now concerning marriage and singleness. And so we had a whole section on marriage and singleness. And then he wrote a, a section on, of course, uh, 8 through 10. We, we spent several weeks there talking about this question about meat offered to idols. And, you know, that was a question that they had. And now he's going to answer a question concerning the wearing of head coverings in worship, right? And really, this falls into another kind of longer section. Chapters 11 through 14 are, are, are Paul addressing how the, the Corinthian believers are to order themselves and participate when they gather on a regular basis for worship. All right? So after this, he's going to jump into the Lord's Supper and, and not just, you know, do it. Hey, there's, you should do it a certain way, and there should be a heart posture when you come to the table. And we'll get into all of that, and I can't wait to get to that passage. All right? And then he's going to talk about the exercise of spiritual gifts in the worship gathering and, and how we ought to think about those things. So let, let's see the overarching point of chapters 11 and 14 is this, that the church really does need to think carefully about what we do when we gather for worship. It's not unimportant, friends, what we do or how we do it. Because just as that pastor friend told me, everything we do communicates something both to the believers that are gathered for worship and to the outside world that's watching us. And friends, there's a lot of churches I don't think that think very carefully. I think we think carefully in the Church of America pragmatically what to do, right? How can we make sure the stage lighting looks good and, you know, all these other things that are not unimportant and there's a place for that, but we don't always think biblically about what we do when we gather, right? How we can be faithful. So, as we come to 1 Corinthians 11, we need to ask, what is this passage teaching us about our worship gathering? What do we need to communicate clearly to the believers within and the outside world? And I think that, that Paul wants us to understand this, that there is distinction in manhood and womanhood. That distinction is seen in rightly ordered authority and submission, and that distinction uniquely reflects the glory of God, all right? Now, I know that probably didn't set well with some of you, so before you get too upset, just know my heart is to teach what's here, so let's see if that's what's here or not, okay? Uh, let's dive into it. Verse 2, Paul writes, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. 
So Paul commends them. I don't know about you, but that, uh, he called them beloved, and now he commends them. This is a church that was a mess, and yet he commends them, namely that they remembered him and the traditions that he had delivered to them. Now, the word traditions, there's the Greek word parodosis. It means teaching. So don't think of this as Paul's like, yeah, you, you remember the traditions of putting the chair in this corner and hanging the banner over here? Yeah, That's not what he's talking about. He's talking here actually about his apostolic teachings to them. But he needs to clarify those teachings a little bit. Much of, of the writings of Paul in the New Testament is here because he needed to clarify something he had taught, right? And so here's what he says in verse 3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Now, again, we know from reading this, right, there's something here about head coverings and instructions for that, and, and we're going to get into that. What does that look like, particularly when it comes to praying and prophesying? But, but here today, I want to focus on what he wants them to understand, and that's the purpose behind that practice, right? He wants them to understand this isn't just some legalistic rule that I put in place. There is a deeper message behind the practice, and the message has everything to do with God's design for men and women, God's design for headship and authority. Now, again, naturally, any time we talk about authority and submission, our natural fibers just bristle up, don't they? I mean, from birth, we don't like the idea of authority, I mean, every kid I know, as much as they love their parents, still wants to push back on the authority of their parents. We're born with that. And, man, we are really, really uncomfortable today in today's world anytime we talk about the concept of authority and headship when it's tied to gender. And, and that's right in some ways because there's been a lot of work done in our world, a lot of work done in society to, society to ensure that there is equality for women. And, friends, that is good and that is right in fact, contrary to popular belief, the equality of women is something that the church has always been at the forefront of and that the Bible clearly teaches on and, and, and gets behind, right? You would do well to note even in our text, as much as it sounds abrasive to us, that there's, there's some things in the culture of which this was written that actually elevated women. The fact that they were gathering for worship to learn, I mean, that was frowned upon in a lot of ancient contexts. Not only that, there's an assumption here that these women aren't just sitting there learning, but they're participating in the worship service, which again, which would have been very counterculture at the time which this is written. So I say that to say, please give the Apostle Paul the benefit of the doubt. Don't automatically just assume that he must be a guy who grew up in a patriarchal society and he's a male chauvinist writing these words. No, his teachings are, along with all of the Bible, communicate over and over again the worth and the value and the dignity of women. Now, probably the most important doctrine in the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, was confirmed by the witness of women. Now, Jesus' ministry, you cannot deny, right, uh, often involved women, right, sitting at his feet, listening, learning, and him empowering them to go and do much for the kingdom of God. And yet, we also have to admit that the Bible equally teaches that there is a distinction between men and women, and it's not just biological. There is a distinction even though we are, carry equal worth, there is a distinction in our roles, which God has created us for. And I think that that's the heart of this passage, right there in verse 3. Now, of course, there's a, a ton of debate about that. And there's a ton of debate about this text. I mean, you'll find a lot of volumes written on this particular text here. And a lot of the debate here in 1 Corinthians 11 centers around the understanding of certain words in this passage. And so I don't normally like to do this, but I want to kind of dig in the weeds a little bit with some of the words here because we've got to really get those down, I think, if we're going to understand this correctly. I want to look in particular at three words in the text here. The words head, the words man or husband or woman, wife, all right? So let's start with the word head. That is probably, if you're looking for one word, is the most important word. That's the most important word in this text. It's used 14 times in 16 verses. It's all over the place here, right? Uh, and it is the Greek word kephale. It's the word that means three different, it can mean three different things. It can mean the head, like as in the physical body part or on your body part on your shoulders. It can mean authority. Or it can mean source, as in like the head of a river, the source of the river, right? So obviously those meanings carry with them different implications, right, And how we read this text. Clearly there are a couple times in this text where Paul's talking about the physical head on your shoulders when he's talking about physically covering your head. But what about the other usage here? 
If Paul is using the word head here as source, well, then there's no implication of authority and there's no implication of submission tied to that, and therefore our applications change quite a bit. So which is it? Is it source or is it authority? What do we do when we come to uh, a, a word, and the, the, the New Testament was written in Greek originally, we come to a Greek word and it has different meanings. And by the way, this happens all the time. In, in the Greek New Testament, right? So for those of you who are really eager Bible students and you're out there looking up on Blue Letter Bible and stuff, I just want to give a word of caution to you to be really careful not to just go, oh, that word means, they could mean that, that's cool, and just like automatically plug it in. We can get in a lot of trouble doing that, right? What do we do? How do we determine how the author meant to use it? Well, there's a couple things we can do. One, we can look at how that word was used in other places, Right? And so when we look at kafale in the Bible, we, we should note that every time, pretty much every time, kafale was used as a metaphor for relationships, it was, it was almost exclusively used as authority and not source. That's kind of like a key, key idea. Maybe that's more likely the use here. Paul, in particular, when he used the word kafale in relation to Jesus, which he, which he refers to Jesus here as the head, or having a head, right? Um, he always uses that word in, in, in conjunction with authority. Let me give you a couple examples. Ephesians chapter 1, 22. It says, he, God the Father, put all things under his feet and gave him, God the Son, Jesus, as head, there's that word, kafale, over all things to the church. And if you read the whole of that passage, you'll see it's all about the enthronement of Jesus and his exalted rule. So it's pretty clear to me that he's using it as authoritative there. Or Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He writes, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, a deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, Christ, who is the head, kephale, of all rule and authority. And you'll see a few verses later the rule and authority that he's talking about is demons and evil spirits. And Jesus, of course, is not the source of those. He is authoritative over them, as we saw in our study through the book of Mark a few years ago, right? He was authoritative over demons. They, they obeyed his voice. So I think when we look at that, the common usage of the word, it's most often meant to be used as authority and not source, all right? But let's take it a step further. What The, the real key to understanding how the author meant to use a word was the context. We have to look at the context. Our context always will drive the meaning. So what's, what, do we, what clues do we find here? Well, let's look at that last phrase there. He says, the head of Christ is God. The head of Christ is God. Now, if we read that as source, then I believe we've created some theological problems here. Because Christ has no source, right? It is, he was not a created being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit all existed eternally as one God in three persons. And so if we read this as source, then we've got some other issues that we've got to untangle here. So it is my opinion, looking at it from all those angles, and I kind of wanted to explain how I got there, that the word head here ought to be read as authority in this text. All right? All right, let's look at some other words. What about man and woman? If you're reading different translations, and I'm sure there are different translations in the room here, you might have noticed that some, I, I read husband, wife here, but you're, you're, if you're reading the NIV or the NASB, it, it uh, translates aner and gune as man and woman, whereas the ESV uh, translates the very same words as husband and wife. So again, what's the author mean here? Um, because those words can be used interchangeably. So looking at its usage elsewhere is pointless because those words are always determined by context. So what's the context tell us here? Well, we'll dig into this a little more next week, but when we get to the end of this passage, he starts talking a lot about nature, doesn't he? When he talks about manhood and womanhood, men and women. So it seems to me that the whole of this text is talking more about the distinctiveness of men and women in God's creation in general and not just in the distinction found in the, in the context of marriage. So I take this to mean man and woman. Even though I like the ESV, I actually prefer man and woman here. There, there are good arguments for just husband and wife here, so I won't speak dogmatically about it, but that's how I read this because of the broader view of what I think is going on in the context, all right? Uh, now, the specific applications of that get a little complicated, all right? For instance, I do not think that in any way here Paul is saying that all women are under the authority or should be submissive to all men. Not at all. 
That's not true. That's not what this text is saying. Nor do I think you can come here uh, to say that women couldn't lead in other realms of life. This text says nothing about whether we could have a woman president or not. All right? I like the comments of Claire Smith. She is the author of the book, God's Good Design, What the Bible Really Says About Men and Women. She writes in an article concerning this text, it's as if the headship Paul is talking about here is potential headship that becomes actual headship in specific situations and relationships. That is, in eldership and leadership in the church community and in the marriage relationship. So the distinction of authority and headship are, I believe, built into manhood and womanhood, but are applied appropriately only in biblically ordained relationships, right? And the two clearly biblically ordained relationships we see in the scriptures are a wife to her husband and to the elders of the church, which they are a part of. So the foundational teaching, just to kind of summarize in verse 3, I believe, is that there is a created design of headship and authority that we see both in our relationship with God and our rela the relationship between men and women, not just, again, in biology, but in our complementing roles. And the church, I believe, needs to see that this distinctiveness, and this is important, doesn't have its origins in culture. It finds its origins in God himself. I think that's what we see there in verse 3. And therefore, those distinctions are to be viewed by us as divinely good, not as oppressive or wrong. It's important, guys, that we communicate uh, as a church those distinctions because we live in a world now where those distinctions are more and more being blurred every day. And we'll get more into the actual text of the head coverings next week uh, and what might be some applications of that. But I really just wanted to sit a little bit this week on that foundation of gender distinction right there in verse 3. Because if we get verse 3, I think the rest of the passage makes a little more sense and flows out of that theological foundation. I think this is what Paul wants them to understand about the practice that he has taught them, right? Now, we're going to jump into the rest of the text next week, all right? So you're like, dang it, I wanted to hear what you had to say about all that stuff. Well, come back next week, all right? That's my little nugget for you, okay? Um, what I want to do to end today is, is to just draw a couple of what I believe are important implications from verse 3. Uh, well, an implication and a qualification. How about that? First implication is this, that this created design of authority is important because it reflects the glory of the Godhead. Now, why is it important that we recognize distinction in manhood and womanhood, that we acknowledge and honor the created design for men and women? Why? Why is that important? Well, because it's a part of reflecting who God is in this world. Uh, the way that Paul frames this is incredibly important, right? He's showing this picture of authority and submission, and he's showing that the authority and submission is in the nature of God himself. Uh, the order here in verse 3 is whack if we're just simply trying to lay out a picture of hierarchy. It's, uh, it's mixed up, isn't it? No, I think Paul is being really intentional here. It's as if Paul wants these Corinthian believers to see, hey, this idea of submission in creation, that is, man is created to be submissive to Christ, woman uh, created to be in submission to her husband, right? Uh, that, that, that this is in order to show something about the Godhead. That indeed, there is even in the Godhead the idea of submission. So he ends that verse with God is the head of Christ. Uh, that is, God the Father is the authority, if we're reading head that way, of the Son, and the Son is therefore in submission to the Father. And therefore, mankind, both male and female, created in the image of God, Genesis 127, we read to start our Sunday service here, can only fully image the glory of the triune Godhead when we live in rightly ordered authority and submission. There is, in other words, something about the goodness and the glory of God in the fullness of Trinitarian beauty that could only be reflected in the existence of both men and women and men and women living within their design. And so when a couple stands before their friends and family on their wedding day and say, I do, Paul says in Ephesians 5, there's so much more happening there than the exclamation point on their love story. Oh no, what's happening there is they are picturing the beauty of Christ and his church. The picture of the beautiful, self-giving, sacrificial headship of Christ and the joyous submission of the church to his lordship. But 
it also, if you think about it, paints not just the gospel, the work of redemption, but it paints a picture of the nature of the Godhead, where the Son lives in perfect and harmonious submission to the Father. And the Spirit is always joyfully deferring and pointing to the Son in all things. And so a married couple that strives to live in this way images the Godhead. The church that seeks to live in accordance with this design reflect the very glory of the God we've come to worship. Men and women who honor this design both in practice and maybe even more importantly in the posture of our hearts image the glory of God. I don't know about you, but this gives a grander picture in my estimation, a better motivation to anyone who might struggle with these concepts here. It's not just, well, that is what it is. It's the way we were created. Deal with it. No. No, this order has an eternal purpose to it of imaging our glorious God correctly. It's not oppressive then. It's beautiful. It's beautiful because God is beautiful. All right? So let's look now at the qualification. Qualification tied to this. It's created design of authority and submission does not imply superiority or inferiority. This is really important to understand. And I realize that might be a hard pill to swallow, but friends, authority doesn't mean superiority and submission doesn't mean inferiority. And we're conditioned in our world to think that way, aren't we? I mean, from birth we are. We're conditioned to think that the CEO in the boardroom has much more worth and value than the dude working in the mailroom. And the word submit has negative connotations, right? In the octagon, if you get submitted, that's you were lesser, right? You were beaten. He's the victor. He's the better man, right? Now, that's how we're conditioned to think. But that's not the biblical view of authority and submission. And it's important that we bring that to, to bear here because oftentimes there are abuses that exist when there's a misunderstanding of biblical authority and submission, and we've seen that all throughout history, haven't we? I mean, there are some uh, loads of dim-witted and honestly weak and cowardly men who have heard these beautiful truths and used them to puff up their own insecure self-view, and then they attempt to lord authority over the women in their lives in abrasive, unloving, and abusive ways. And friends, I just want you to hear, that's unbiblical, and it's absolutely unacceptable. Those are the men I'd like to throw in the octagon with Brock Lesnar for a few minutes, all right? It's, it's a gross misunderstanding of the role that God has given you. I mean, look at Jesus. And Jesus is our head, but how did he exercise his headship? By laying down his life for us. Jesus' headship was sacrificial. It was self-giving. So men ought to quickly discard any silly notion that they might have in their minds that their created design somehow puts them in a position of superiority. I have to admit that much of the overcorrection on this doctrine in our world today is often the result of ungodly men confusing their God-given design with an unbiblical view of superiority. And then on the other side of the conversation, there are many sisters in Christ who have absolutely rightly assessed their fully equal worth and value and dignity in the Lord. But... They've seen this design of headship and submission as saying that women are inferior. And friends, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. I love what Thomas Schreiner writes on this. He says, why does Paul place the head of Christ as God last? I think Paul added the head of God over Christ right after asserting the headship of man over woman in order to teach us that authority over a, of a man over a woman doesn't imply inferiority of women or the superiority of men. Some Corinthians may have concluded that the headship of a man over a woman dismissed woman's worth. But Paul anticipates this objection, and he adds that God is the head over Christ. And even though God, i.e. the Father, is the head over Christ, he is not essentially greater than Christ. So too, even women who are under men's authority are not essentially inferior Paul follows that same pattern throughout the text in 7 and 12. 7 to 10, he says women were created for man's glory and sake. And in 11 and 12, he shows that that does not involve the inferiority of women. That's so important to remember. It really is. Look at Jesus. He was not inferior to the Father. His submission wasn't weakness. I mean, no Christian worth their salt reads the beauty of the passion 
and sees Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane sweating blood, drops of blood, because he was about to bear the weight of the sins of the world, praying, Father, not my will, but your will be done. That's a prayer of submission. No Christian looks at that and goes, oh, how inferior, how weak. No, we, we write songs about the glory of that submission, don't we? We sing them at the top of our lungs. We go, praise God for the submission of the Son. So for many of us, I'll just say this because for many of us, when it comes to this discussion, we just got to rewire the way we think about authority and submission. Christ was the perfect man, wasn't he? Preston and I were talking about this yesterday. Christ is the perfect man. He perfectly represented this beautiful submission, and he perfectly represents lordship and headship over the church. Friends, the submission of Jesus to the Father is what won our salvation. Maybe you're here today, and this all sounds really foreign to you, and honestly, maybe it sounds quite offensive. I get it. But I hope you won't miss that truth, that the submission of Jesus to go to the cross is the hope of sinful humanity. See, God is holy, and we are sinners, broken, woeful sinners. Now, our sin uh, created this debt that we just can't pay, except by way of wrath and judgment. And we will for eternity if we step out of this life still with that sin debt in place. But God so loved the world that he sent the son and the son submitted and went. And he willingly went to the cross. And he died a perfect sinless savior in our place. Friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, no, he died for you. I just want to beg of you to consider your sin debt today. And to throw yourself on the mercy and the grace of Jesus by faith. Church, I hope that we hear the first part of this message well. I pray that we find ourselves more willing to submit to God's design for our lives than we are to the changing winds of culture around us. I pray that we can learn to celebrate the beauty of the way God made us. And to live our lives in accordance with his design for us. I hope that the men in this room will wake up and understand their role. If you're married, to love and lead your wives. If you're not, to someday maybe do that. But to be the kind of men that can love and lead your church family. And to treat your sisters with uh, the dignity and value they deserve as image bearers of God. And redeemed by the blood of Christ. I pray we take seriously, men, our call to lead, and that we'll do it the same way Jesus did, sacrificially and selflessly. It's a hard calling, but it's a beautiful one. And I pray for for the women in this room this morning. I pray that you would see the beauty of your womanhood and that you would embrace it in all of it, in all its created design for your life. And so I don't know what you heard from this message because I know the enemy loves to sow seeds of discord. But here's what I want you to hear. You are necessary. You are valuable. We need you. We need each other, men and women, to fully engage our glorious Lord and worship him. I know this isn't a popular message in the world that we live in, but we need to be submissive to God's word. And more than that, Because we could be submissive with gritted teeth, right? More than that, we should trust that what God has done is good. Because he is good. And may we honor the Lord together as men and women in Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. It is good. Uh, Sometimes it's hard to hear the goodness of it because we're broken people. And we grow up in a broken world. We live day in, day out with our minds and our hearts flooded with broken messages. But God, you are indeed a good God, and you created us good. Everything you created, you said, it is good, man and woman. Lord, I want to thank you for that. And I want to ask and pray today that we would allow you, Lord, to just transform the way we think about creation, the way we think about you the way we think about one another. The reality is, God, we will, until you return, struggle with this because we just won't live in light of our design often. 
But I pray that we'll strive day by day to live more and more in a way that honors you, Lord. Um, so, Lord, I pray for transformation in this place. I pray for transformation in my heart. And I pray that you would be honored and glorified. God, we love you. And we pray all of this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.